Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Lawrence. I'm the director of the Center for Livable Future. And uh, we are delighted. We're piggybacking on an invitation that was extended to uh, Michael Taylor from our Center for Law and Public Health for Mike's participation in a class later this afternoon. And we jumped at the chance to uh, uh, sponsor this noon talk and to have a chance to uh, interact with Mike about a number of issues that are, of course, uh, central to the work of the Center for Liberal Future and our interest in uh, the food system. Uh, it's also a special pleasure for me to welcome Mike, whom I first met uh, a decade ago when he and I were on an IOM committee uh, tasked with the challenge of reducing dioxin in the food supply. And Mike's wisdom and experience uh, was an enormous contribution to the success, I think it was a successful outcome, uh, of that committee. Um, so in uh, January 2010, uh, the Obama administration appointed Mike to be Deputy Commissioner of FDA for Foods. This is a newly created position, and Mike was charged with managing all of FDA's food safety and nutrition programs. In this position, he reports directly to uh, the Commissioner of Food and Drugs, uh, Dr. Margaret Hamburg. In 2012, the name of Mike's position was changed to Deputy Commissioner for Foods and Veterinary Medicine. And we have several vet vets in the audience, Mike. Um, in early 2011, uh, President Obama signed into law the Food Safety Modernization Act, known as FISMA, which was the first major revision of the nation's food safety laws in many decades. And as many of you know, responsibility for food safety in the U.S. Uh, is divided between FDA and U.S. Department of Agriculture, which regulates meat and poultry. And Mike, we were talking upstairs about uh, challenges to organic chemistry. And something I still can't get fixed in my brain is if it's a cracked egg, one of you is responsible. If it's a whole egg, somebody else. Is that still true? <laughs> OK. So anyway, that's the kind of complexity of the regulatory environment that Mike is responsible for translating into uh, programs and activities that protect the health of the public. Uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, Mike was director of USDA's Food Safety and Inspection uh, Service, so he has had significant senior level responsibility on both sides of this fence. At FSIS, uh, Mike was responsible for putting in place uh, wide-ranging food safety reforms in the face of considerable industry opposition. In 1999, uh, 1991, uh, Mike was appointed to another newly created position at FDA as Deputy Commissioner for Policy, where he reported directly to then Commissioner uh, Dr. David Kessler, one of the warmest and fuzziest of our commissioners. Uh, Mike was deeply involved with the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act of 1990, which brought us the now ubiquitous nutrition facts panels on the side of packaging that we see in supermarkets. And one of our graduate students is here who has a special interest in food labeling. So uh, if you have a chance to talk a little bit about that, it'd be great. Uh, Mike is a lawyer by training, and he began his career in 1976 as a lawyer in the chief counsel's office at FDA, and eventually became the executive assistant to then commissioner, uh, Dr. Jerry Goyen. Uh, Mike has also been a lawyer in private practice and a professor at GW School of Public Health. So uh, before welcoming Mike to the stage, I also just want to uh, uh, welcome uh, Jim Miller, who some of you may not yet know. Jim is a lawyer working on Food and Drug Administration issues for 25 years in Washington, and uh, was an MPH student, finished in 2008, and now is with Steve Terrett in the uh, Center for Public Health and the Law. And Laura Pillsbury, uh, whom I first met when she was a staffer at the IOM, who's celebrating her first year of uh, containing the uh, deputy commissioner as he travels around. So Mike, uh, please come, and uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. Well, 
Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, Laura's done a terrible job of containing me for the last year, but I'm honored to be working with her anyway. I'm really pleased to, um, to be here today. I did spend a couple of years uh, before coming back to FDA this third time um, in a school of public health. I was a professor, research professor at the GW School of Public Health, as Bob indicated, and so it's just really comfortable for me to be in this setting and to share some perspectives on what we're doing at FDA and, uh, and hopefully having some dialogue about it. I, um, I want to speak you know, fairly briefly. I want to cover a fair amount of terrain, but do it in a fairly high level, uh, relatively brief way, and hope that we can have some dialogue and some questions and, you know, about anything I talk about or any other subject that's on your mind about what's going on at the Food and Drug Administration. Um, you know, I, I originally thought that a way to approach this would just be to, to go through kind of the, the, the laundry list, if you will, of things that we're doing at FDA. And I think as, you know, the slide indicates that there's a lot going on on the food side of the Food and Drug Administration related to public health outcomes that we all care about and I'm sure are important to a lot of people here. Um, and I am going to go over what we're doing in food safety, nutrition, and, and food labeling. Um, but I but I also thought that it would be important, particularly in this setting, to review some of the, the understanding about how what we do fits into a larger context. I, I, I say review because I'm imagining that a lot of what I'm going to say, at least conceptually, you've been exposed to, those of you who are students and, and also faculty here, I mean, you've been exposed to before, you've thought about before, but I want to relate some of these basic elements, contextual elements for how we work on public health, specifically to the food program uh, at at the Food and Drug Administration. And so I'll, I'll start with some uh, kind of introductory concepts and then I'll go through some of the things we've been working on and, and give you some highlights and then, then let's, have some, uh, let's have some discussion. Um, you know, the first point that I think just we, you know, just hits me in the face all of the time and, and I think it's important to keep in mind is that we, you know, all of us who are working on, on issues that, that relate to the food system are working, you know, within the context of a truble, truly global food system. And, and I'm not using that term global just to connote the, you know, the fact that we've got this big food industry that's global and trading food all over the world. That's part of it. That's part of what I mean when I say global food system. But I'm really talking much more fundamentally about uh, just the pervasiveness of the food system as an economic and social system. I don't think there's another system, if you will, when I think about food system that is as pervasive as is fundamental to, to human beings and the existence of our species and the food system. And, and I think the, that having an appreciation of that is, a, is sort of a starting point uh, for understanding the issues we work on and, and how we go about working on them. And it, it certainly includes, um, when I think about food system, it includes what goes on in the sort of the industrial world, um, the world that, that, that most of us grew up in and are familiar with. Um, but it also, if you travel around the world, you know, you just see the, the incredible diversity uh, of the food system. Uh, I did a lot of work in the 10 years before I came back to FDA on, on U.S. agricultural development policy for Africa. If you travel in Africa and just see, you know, the reality of subsistence agriculture, um, you know, how that works, uh, how that succeeds in many wonderful ways, how it doesn't succeed in other ways, uh, you know, that's part of the food system, too. And, you know, you can translate that um, you know, into the United States context, and you think about, again, big global, big urban, you know, uh, uh, you know areas where, where being able to provide high, you know, high volumes of food is, is, is crucial, but also, you know, we've done a lot of traveling um, as part of our, our produce safety work uh, to areas uh, in New England, for example, where, where local food systems are so crucial to, you know, what people care about and to the, the local social and, and economic systems in these communities. And so, so when we think about uh, the food system, we think about it in all this complexity and all this diversity, and I think with some appreciation of the fact that it's kind of amazing, you know, that, that and if you look at the logistics of, of how we actually feed 7 billion people, it's a pretty amazing phenomenon, this, this food system. Uh, and a lot, I think, to uh, think positively about when you, when you think about the level of effort and ingenuity that, that, that goes into feeding people. You know, what we also know is that this global food system has lots of shortcomings. I mean, starting from the fact that its most fundamental purpose of food security for all is not achieved for 800 or 900 million people around the world. So as much as we might marvel at the kind of the scale and the, and the ingenuity of the food system, it falls short in that very fundamental way. But we also know it has other, and again, people working in this institution know this full well and have studied it and documented it. Um, 
uh, it falls short in other ways. I mean, the, the, the environmental impacts of the food system are real. The negative impacts uh, in terms of how resources are used, but also how the quality of the natural environment is affected uh, by the production of all this food, by the transport of all this food. These are very uh, real issues. Um, we also know, of course, that, that when it comes to public health outcomes, which is what we're involved with at FDA, what I know many in this school, obviously this school is all about public health, um, you know, there also are significant uh, consequences of you know, flowing from the food system, negative consequences uh, for public health. Um, uh, just past, you know, beyond the fact that, that many people don't get enough to eat, we also have the fact that many, you know, there, there's a large percentage of populations now globally you know, who are obese, you know, who suffer from diabetes, you know, chronic diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer. We know that most of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in this country are caused or have some relationship to the food system, the food supply, the way in which people at a societal level and at an individual level uh, use food, uh, incorporate food into their lives. And, and it's that sort of negative externality on the, the health side that is where FDA works in the food system. You know, we're, we're not, uh, the BA, we're just a part of a system, but, but it, is, it is with respect to these significant you know, public health consequences, negative consequences that flow from the food system uh, that we, uh, we derive our mission and, and do our, our work. Uh, and, and so one, the starting point, I think, for what I, what I want to say today is to is just have an appreciation, uh, not only of the large food system context, but of the, of the forces that are at work you know, in society, in the world, that affect public health outcomes. And again, all in the spirit of trying to put what we do uh, into some context. And starting with just the natural world, you know, whether it's the fact that uh, the kind of pathogens, uh, E. coli, salmonella, uh, listeria, um, that are significant uh, causes of foodborne illness in this country and around the world, these are part of the natural environment. The food is then managed in a way that, uh, that results in those bacteria becoming part of what is actually on people's dinner plate. You know, but the origin of that is, is the natural environment. That's part of what we, we deal with. You know, the natural environment affects public health outcomes also just in the way in which individual human beings are genetically made up and, 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 and disposed to use food and to store fat and to, uh, you know, have other responses to food. So the natural environment is a, is a driver of public health outcomes. The social environment is as well, obviously. And again, this is just repeating points that I know are very familiar to people here. Um, but the way in which uh, people have come through culture, through society, to relate themselves to food can either result in very good impacts on health or very negative impacts uh, on health. We all know that. Um, uh, we also know that people demographically, for economic reasons, have different access to food and different access to quality foods. And so social factors there uh, are, are at work in affecting uh, public health outcomes. Uh, and then economics. Uh, you know, comes into play in a serious way uh, as well. And, you know, I think this is a very fundamental phenomenon that, that, uh, that we run into all the time in our work and I think just has to be grappled with, and that is that, that the nature of the, uh, the food supply, the food system, um, and the evolution of the industrial uh, uh, agricultural practices, the industrialization of the food system that, that we see and that is a subject of study and concern here and in other places, you know, is a function of some basic economic forces, starting with um, what is, I suppose, a social situation, but that is the demand for, of, of consumers for cheap food, uh, for cheap and convenient food. Um, and that, that is a driving force in the structure, the economic structure of the food industries that we regulate and that are responsible for putting a lot of the food uh, that you see in supermarkets, you know, out there for the public to, to choose from. And that has consequences for public health, there's just no question about it. Um, you know, whether it's the way in which animals are produced and, 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 uh, uh, or, or the way in which uh, food is processed, uh, the nature of the substances that are used to, to, uh, to process food, you know, all that economic pressure that is coming from society is real and it affects public health outcomes. Uh, there's just no question about it. Uh, so the other influencer of public health, again, getting now to where FDA you know, plays a direct role, uh, obviously, is, is public policy. Um, and I'm going to talk about how FDA plays its role in the public policy realm uh, to address public health outcomes of the food system. But I, I want to comment a little bit about what I mean when I say public policy and acknowledge 
that that a big part of um, uh, and a big influencer of our ability to do our job is is the inevitably political aspect of public policy. And by political, you know, I don't mean party politics or electoral politics. I mean the interplay of forces that occurs in our government legitimately in terms of the way in which our democratic society works, you know, that involves stakeholders, members of society having a strong interest in what we do, being heard in the system. They're certainly heard by us, but the, the politicization, to use that term, you know, occurs when these stakeholders legitimately, you know, go to Congress, uh, whether it's industry or consumer or sustainable agriculture groups go to Congress and have their voices heard. And that's legitimate. That's part of the process. Uh, but it has a big impact, you know, because that filters back to us in very concrete ways. And so Congress legitimately controls what our authority is. You know, they control what our budget is. They control uh, whether we have oversight that is a, that can have an influence uh, on, on what we do and, um, and, and uh, can sometimes have a slightly... Uh, a diverting effect on people like me. If we get too much oversight, uh, some is good. Too much is is a bit of a distraction. So, so there's this politicization phenomenon that that you know, frankly, I've seen evolve enormously in the time in which I've been, you know, in government. I, I started out in the Carter administration, and uh, um, you know, was able to be the executive assistant to the commissioner of, of food and drugs, and never once go to a meeting at the White House, not once. And in fact, I was the commissioner wanted to appoint me to this political job as his executive assistant and didn't even think it was necessary to call the secretary's office and let them know that they were appointing me and there was no political vetting whatsoever. I told him, Dr. Goyen, you probably should call the secretary's office and give him a little heads up on that, which he did and it was fine. Nobody asked me a single question about my politics or was, I was not vetted in any way. You know, politically I was put into, into that job. You know, fast forward to the 1990s when I was deputy commissioner for policy at FDA. You know, there would be days, particularly when we were working on the Nutrition, Labeling, and Education Act, I'd be at the White House for two meetings a day. I mean, it was just, you know, completely transformed uh, approach, and, and I think, you know, it's continued to evolve. There's a, there's a trend in the administration towards centralization of decision-making. Um, it, it's driven by a lot of factors, uh, including what happens on the Hill, including what happens in the media, but it creates a very dynamic political environment in which we work and do public policy. And, you know, there was a time when I was growing up, you know, again, going back to the beginning of my career, when you, you almost just wanted to deny that politics had anything to do with public health and kind of pretend that, well, we had the law and the science and we were going to make the right decisions for public health. And that's, of course, what you want to do. But the reality of the world we work in is that it is a very politicized process to make public health policy. Um, and, and I, you know, you cannot fight the idea. I don't fight the idea. That, that everyone who comes to the government with a, you know, something to say should be heard and, and is entitled to be heard. The question is, how do you then structure the work of expert regulatory agencies to be able to do their jobs in that environment? And, and that's, a, you know, that's a continuing uh, challenge. Uh, so stepping out of the politics for a moment and kind of looking at the basics of our tools and uh, that, that, that sort of provide the, the basic foundation for our work, um, again, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty obvious, you know, the law uh, is what authorizes what we do. It empowers us to take action. It, it constrains us in certain ways. It defines the boundaries on, on what we're authorized to do. And, and it also la lays out, in many cases, the procedures we have to go through, the rulemaking procedures or the adjudicatory procedures or the court procedures that we have to go through to achieve our, our purposes. So the law is a very big deal at, at FDA um, and, a, and a, a really powerful force in our, our and how we go about achieving our, our public health goals. Science, obviously, is the bedrock and the foundation. We, you know, we're expected as the expert regulatory agency to, to harness the best science uh, that's available and, and to apply the law to that, figure out what's the right answer from a public health standpoint grounded in the best science. You know, the, the, the basic tool that we use to achieve results, again, oversimplifying uh, uh, to some degree, but is standards, various kinds of standards. We're, empowered or directly charged by Congress with creating, you know, whether it's standards for how food is produced or standards about the levels of a contaminant that can be in food or, or standards about food labeling. You know, we're in the business of setting standards and then getting the public health result you know, by seeing that those, that we get high rates of compliance with those standards. Uh, so that standards aren't just words on a page, but they actually change practices on the ground in a way that uh, that advances to, to public health goals. Uh, so, so surrounding that, I mean, those are the basic tools. That's the textbook 
um, uh, sort of toolkit. But you know, surrounding that and, and, and really fundamental to our ability to be successful is what I you know, conveniently call public health judgment. The thing that I and my colleagues get to exercise you know, in this complex environment, you know, taking all these tools into account, you know, how do you actually make decisions that, that achieve results that are practical in the world in which we're, we're working? And so public health judgment um, is sort of, again, at the heart of, of, of how we go about our work and, and, and how we achieve uh, public health results. Um, this is a, a sort of a, a summary of um, the categories, if you will, of, of what is on FDA's food plate. Um, we're, we're borrowing uh, from the USDA, obviously, here with this clever graphic. Um, uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, some activities in each of these categories. Microbi micro microbial hazards, of course, is uh, what we're addressing uh, through the implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act to deal with uh, microbial hazards in, in food. Uh, chemical hazards come in, in many different you know, categories, including uh, unintended uh, hazards. Uh, Dr. Lawrence and I worked together on, a, on an IOM report, as he mentioned, uh, dealing with dioxin in the food supply. Nobody wants it there. It gets there through a host of natural and human processes. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about arsenic and rice. There, there are hazards in the food supply, chemical hazards nobody wants there. And then there are other chemicals in the food supply that are put there purposefully. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, antibiotics uh, used in animal production. Uh, there are food additives, there are color additives, uh, other substances that are purposefully added, added to food for specific purposes. We actually regulate in our program, not in the title of our program, but we regulate uh, cosmetics as well in our program. So chemical, um, uh, potential chemical risks associated with cosmetics are within our bailiwick as well. And then on the nutrition side, um, you know, we have, a, we have a, a authorities that permit us to address the composition of food to some extent. I'm going to talk about a couple of the big ticket items we've worked on recently, like trans fat and, and sodium. Uh, but we regulate, for example, the nutritional quality of, of infant formula to, in a very uh, fine way to be sure that the nutrients that need to be in an infant formula uh, to, to support growth of infants are in fact there and the products are, are manufactured in a really reliable way to, to achieve that. And then food labeling. I'll talk a little bit about some things that we're doing in the labeling realm where you know, closely related to nutrition. It's all about trying to foster uh, the ability of consumers to choose healthy diets in accordance with the dietary guidelines. And then uh, particularly given yesterday's event, I can't resist saying a little bit about where we are in antimicrobial resistance and knowing that the the Center for a Livable Future has uh, various issues they want to take up with me this afternoon when we meet about, uh, uh, about that initiative. But that, it's a very important public health problem, and I, I think we've taken some important steps, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. You, you might think, and I sometimes feel actually, that my world is kind of like this slide, you know, it's this chaotic, um, sort of wild uh, environment, and uh, where very little control and a sense of chaos pervades. Um, and sometimes it feels that way, but I, you know, we find that. Um, you know, the strength that we have is that we have a public health mission. And, um, and if, we, if we maintain that as sort of the, the reference point for what we're doing and, and commit ourselves to making progress on public health issues, then, you know, a lot of clarity, you know, can be derived. And, and, and so for us, you know, there, there's some basic anchors and, and that anchor the way we do our work, that, that guide the way we do our work, and they're just highlighted here. again. Pretty straightforward stuff, but it, it's it's important to, to know what your basic reference points are when you when you do this work. And you know, starting at the top with with knowing what the public health goal is. Why does it matter? You know, to be implementing the Food Safety Modernization Act. Well, there are 48 million people get sick every year, 3,000 die, 125,000 go to the hospital every year from pathogens in food that are largely preventable. Um, and so we have a clear mission, you know, to reduce that, to, to, to address that. Uh, we have to act on the, on the best available science. You know, we never have perfect science. You know, we have to have sufficient science, but, uh, but we have to act and, and, and be able to and then ground what we do in, in science that, that is credible to us and credible and explainable to the public as, as well. Um, this issue of risk-based priorities that's noted here, I mean, this is crucial. Uh, in, in any public health environment. Again, I think not a news flash to anybody here. There, there are always going to be more public health problems, more opportunities to reduce risk to public health than we will have resources to do. Whether it's FDA resources or societal resources, we're always limited by resources. So how do you set risk-based priorities 
you know, how do you do that in as data-driven a way as possible? We've, we have a whole initiative going on at FDA to strengthen our ability to do that, um, but it's crucial to long-term success, uh, just as is uh, public engagement um, in, in what we do. Um, and I, I really mean that in this case um, in, in the sense of uh, the public at large. You know, the, the public uh, uh, is a real actor in what we do. The public has expectations that get manifested to us in lots of ways, directly from people, through the press. Um, when something goes wrong, we find out just how much it matters to people that things go right when it comes to food safety uh, issues. And so public engagement is crucial in being transparent with information uh, that we have so the public can engage, can know what we're doing is another you know, major thrust of how we're trying to guide our work. You know, stakeholder partnerships is another form of public engagement. And here I'm really focusing you know, certainly on engagement with folks like the conveners of this meeting, the Center for a Livable Future, um, but also people in the consumer community, people in, in, the, um, in other parts of the NGO community, but, but very much uh, people in the industry community who are in, engaged in the food system as producers, processors, uh, handlers of, of food. And uh, I'll give a few examples of, of how we find that engaging with these folks, when we can define a common goal, and fortunately, food safety is largely a common goal uh, when it comes to the burden of foodborne illness in this country and the, dis the disruption it has. You know, we've got to be able to find ways to work with stakeholders to get to desired outcomes. And then finally, uh, the local to global perspective just reiterates the point I made earlier about the, um, uh, the global uh, nature of our food system and meaning that in a very inclusive way. And, Again, the experiences that we've had in implementing the produce provisions of Food Safety Modernization Act drive that point home. We, we, we have to, uh, to really look both locally and globally in figuring out practical ways to achieve our, our food safety purposes. So I'm going to now go into the, the laundry list. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I could take an hour on each of these. I promise you I won't um, um, because I am eager to, to hear questions from you. But, uh, but I want to just I can highlight some of the points I've made already about how we approach our work, but also just give you a sense of the breadth of, of what we're doing and the volume of work um, that's going on at FDA. Uh, and, and part of this, quite frankly, I want to say is, to, is, is that I think the people who are actually at FDA doing this work deserve credit they don't usually get um, for the work that they're, they're doing. They work extremely hard. They're, they're, they're underfinanced, overstressed, um, and producing a heck of a lot of, of, of very important product, as I'll uh, as I'll outline here. You know, the Food Safety Modernization Act, of course, was signed by the President in uh, January of 2011. It is the, the, by far the, the, the most significant overhaul of, of food safety law and practice in history in our country um, because it's, it's, it's mandating a, a shift fundamentally from a system that reacts to food safety problems like the, the pathogens that make so many people sick and establishes the principle that there has to be accountability uh, and clear standards for preventing problems. And so it's a shift from, from reaction to prevention that Congress is, is, is mandating. Uh, and, and so we're, we're directed by Congress to establish standards uh, that set the standard for prevention across the spectrum of the food system, starting on the farm for produce, uh, including manuf all manufacturing and processing facilities, uh, safe transport, and then critically, a, a, an entirely new toolkit for overseeing imported uh, foods, product coming into this country, which is a significant uh, food safety uh, and, and, uh, and consumer confidence issue. We, we, in aggregate, uh, we import about 15% of the food we eat, but it's about 80% of the seafood is imported, 50% of the fresh fruit, 20% of the fresh vegetables um, we consume in this country are imported. And so, so this law has taken a very global approach, appropriately so. Um, it's also a law that, um, that recognizes the role that the private sector has, has taken in innovating for food safety because these, the, the preventive control standards that Congress has directed us uh, to establish uh, in regulation were really developed by leading companies who had huge brand equity stake in avoiding disruptions of their product lines uh, due to food safety problems. And, and so they've created processes for managing within their own systems, for managing their supply chains uh, that many companies are doing and doing very well, but many companies aren't doing. They don't either have the sophistication or the commitment or the resources to do it. And what Congress has said, we need a standard that brings everybody up to an acceptable standard of prevention 
you know, as demonstrated to be feasible by a lot of companies who are already doing it, FDA now has the job of bringing everybody up to that standard. And then we're also given much stronger tools to ensure that once we set those standards, they're in fact being, being met. We have new enforcement tools, uh, administrative enforcement tools, as well as, as I, as I mentioned, much stronger tools for overseeing the safety of, of imports. Um, we've got a lot of momentum in implementing this law. We've published uh, five major rulemaking proposals just this year. There'll be another one rolled out next week, uh, a seventh uh, in January. Uh, we are uh, we actually under a court order to complete the rulemaking uh, uh, by the summer of, of 2015. Um, and so we're, we're moving down a, a, a pathway that, that I think is going to, over the long haul, make an enormous difference uh, in how we're able to ensure the safety of the food supply and to, to strengthen public confidence uh, as well and reduce, ultimately, the test is, can we reduce the burden of foodborne illness associated with pathogens in food? And, and that's what the Food Safety Modernization Act is all about. Uh, I'll say a couple things about antimicrobial resistance. Um, we did take some significant steps yesterday. Um, this is a, you know, a long-standing issue. Um, I happen to remember, just to date myself completely, I started at FDA in 1976. Uh, in 1977, uh, FDA published a Notice of Opportunity for Hearing, which, is, which triggers the, the legal process, administrative regulatory process, through which FDA can revoke licenses for animal drugs. Uh, but this notice addressed uh, uh, penicillin and tetracycline categories of, of drugs. Um, because FDA and the scientific community recognized a long time ago that this is, a, this is a, the problem of resistance caused by the use of antibiotics for growth promotion and feed efficiency, so-called production uses in animal agriculture, creates a public health problem associated with the resistance of, of, of human pathogens to medically significant uh, antibiotics. Uh, Congress immediately said, thanks, but no thanks. Congress immediately said, we won't fund you to do that precluded FDA from taking action. And, and frankly, this issue ever since has been it sort of epitomized uh, the politicized public health issue. Um, and so the question you know, we've confronted is, is how do you make progress on this issue and how do you take advantage of the fact the world is changing? I mean, the science is getting better and better. Um, uh, I think there's no dispute in the public health and scientific community that the, the overuse of antibiotics is a public health problem. How do you make problems, uh, how do you make progress uh, towards addressing that, that public health problem? Um, and what's happened and, and what helps make it feasible, frankly, is that, is that, um, that, that the market has changed, that, that uh, the consumers in, in the United States and other parts of the world have, have joined into what is, again, this fundamentally political process uh, and said, um, you know, this is not acceptable. And, and FDA has, has continued to develop the data that supports that there's a public health concern. And we found a pathway uh, that involves working with companies who have themselves come to realize that this is not a sustainable a course. And, and FDA really took a big step back in 2009 to, uh, to, 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 to drive this forward by declaring for the first time categorically uh, that the use of medically significant antibiotics for growth promotion and feed efficiency uses is not judicious, is not appropriate, and should be uh, eliminated, should be phased out uh, over, over time. Um, and since then, we've been able to, 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 to bring along an industry that's willing to, uh, to implement that. Um, and as opposed to going through what would be literally decades of product-by-product product administrative litigation, uh, to remove these products through the, 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 the regulatory process. So what we announced yesterday uh, was the, the, the final, putting in place the final guidance or, or policy pathway for uh, industry to voluntarily remove these growth promotion feed efficiency uses from their labels. Um, once they remove those uses, those uses become illegal and, and it would be unlawful for the farmer, unlawful uh, for anybody to be using those drugs in animals for feed efficiency uh, growth promotion, you know, production type uses, and the remaining uses for legitimate animal health purposes will are also going to be brought under uh, veterinary supervision. So it's so we're moving from a status quo in which today any uh, rancher or animal producer can go down to the feed store, buy feed or, or buy the antibiotic, administer to their animals without any veterinary supervision. We're now saying that that first of all, 
there, there can be no use of these products for, for production purposes, and any remaining uses have to be a, a, as a result of a prescription from a veterinarian under veterinary supervision. So, you know, so we're reducing the number of uses that are possible, and we're putting remaining ones under medical, uh, under veterinary supervision. This is a big step. It's not the last step we need to take. Um, it's going to require sustained effort to, to make this real on the ground, and I know you know, the concerns in, in this institution, Center for a Livable Future, about you know, whether this is going to be effective. We've got to make it effective because it's crucial from a public health standpoint that, that we do that. So uh, I welcome questions or comments or suggestions on that, but it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the bigger public health things that we've, we're doing. Uh, we think it's really important and we're very committed uh, to making a success of it. Uh, a couple of other, other items that uh, have gotten some visibility and, and you'll continue to see work on, particularly uh, on arsenic and rice. Um, again, arsenic unavoidable in the environment to some extent, also present in the environment due to past agricultural practices where our cynical pesticides and fertilizers have been used. Um, we're finding levels of arsenic in, in, in rice that, that, that tell us that we need to really understand from a public health standpoint what is the hazard. Uh, we need to understand what are the practical ways to reduce. You know, arsenic is a staple of the diet. Um, it's got uh, an important role in, in, the, in the diet. Uh, so we're, we're working hard to tackle this issue. We completed some significant sampling of, of arsenic and published results of arsenic, showing arsenic levels in a variety of, of, of rice and, and rice products uh, earlier this fall. Um, we're working on a, a very substantial risk assessment, working with EPA and, and uh, uh, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences to, to really characterize the risk, and we'll come up with a risk management strategy uh, to, to hopefully make progress on, on this public health issue. Uh, the French fries are not to, to make you hungry, they're to uh, indicate that we are, we've also recently taken action to address another unintended chemical contaminant of food, and that's acrylamide, which you may or may not have heard of, but, but potatoes in particular, when heated to high temperature, uh, and if they have, um, uh, based on their sugar content, can produce ac acrylamide, which is a, a, an unwanted chemical contaminant that is a likely human carcinogen, and that, of course, we want to minimize. And so FDA has issued a guidance uh, to, to give our best judgment about ways in which practices can reduce that. It's something that's very difficult to regulate your way to a solution, uh, but there, the industry, again, has no interest in being identified with... Uh, and with cancer resulting from their products. And so, again, it, addressing this issue through uh, the issuance of, of guidance uh, earlier, earlier this year. Uh, these, are, these are big ticket items that, that I've put up here. These are, and these, these have to do with um, intended, um, the, the intended addition of, of substances to the food supply. Um, and I'll start with trans fat, which is uh, a topic we're, we're further along on. Um, you may have seen that we issued um, a notice um, with respect to trans fat, stating our conclusion that these substances do not meet the standard, and, and again, trans fat being present as a result of their presence in partially hydrogenated oils, that these uh, trans fat bearing oils do not meet the legal standard to be on the market, um, and, and putting industry on notice of that, giving them an opportunity to comment on the science, but we are on a pathway to, tr to phase out the remaining uses of trans fat in the food supply. Um, big progress was made on this issue when trans fat was added to the Nutrition Facts panel a few years ago, but there's still significant trans fat in the diet, and we think it shouldn't be there, and we're on a pathway to phase that out. Um, you know, the coffee cup, we're not going to take your coffee away. We probably actually, now that I think about it, shouldn't have used the coffee cup graphic because we're not here to take your coffee away, but, but the fact of the matter is that as you may have noticed, caffeine's been cropping up in a lot of different places, non-conventional places in the food supply. We're all familiar with, with caffeine in coffee and tea as a naturally occurring substance. As substance. It's been present in certain soft drinks at, rel at relatively modest levels for a long time. It's now cropping up in a, in a wide variety of energy drink products, often at much higher levels than we've seen in the past in soft drinks. It's been added to a number of, 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 of food products, per se, including snack foods and candies, uh, gum products. Uh, you know, there's a, Kraft has a, a way of, of these Mio energy drops of caffeinating your drinking water. Um, there's a, there, you can get wired waffles and wired syrup online. Um, we think there's a real problem around this indiscriminate caffeination of the food supply. Um, and we've, we've teed this issue up in a serious way with the industry and with the scientific community. And we're on a pathway to assess 
what actions we need to take to put some boundaries around caffeine use. Um, you know, the Institute of Medicine uh, convened a, a workshop uh, at our request in August. Uh, we're expecting a report from them early next year. Um, we've got to figure out, you know, what's the right way to limit the, the, the running room of the marketing people who you know, will take advantage of every marketing niche they see uh, to add caffeine to food. That's, to us, not acceptable as a public health matter because of, you know, our concerns about kids, about uh, certain other vulnerable populations. Um, we just don't know enough to have confidence that that's safe, and we also think it's not a, a, a good use of, of the food supply to, to you know, be a, a widespread source of central nervous system stimulation. So watch, watch us on caffeine. I think in the coming year, you know, we hope to make some significant progress in putting boundaries on, on that. You know, sodium, uh, again, a longstanding public health issue. Um, you know, we consume, uh, the, the mean sodium consumption in this country is about 3,500 milligrams. The mean sh for most of the population should be 2,300 milligrams. Um, uh, that's a, you know, if we can reduce that, we can reduce significantly uh, uh, morbidity and mortality associated with heart disease. Uh, we know clearly the link between sodium and, and, and hypertension. Uh, we're in the process, again, responding in this case to another Institute of Medicine study uh, on sodium and on ways to reduce it in the food supply, which recommended you know, gradual comprehensive reduction um, that, that gives consumers' palates a chance to adapt. People will not buy bad tasting food just because it's low sodium. And, and in fact, as soon as you tell most consumers that a food is low sodium, they want nothing of it. So how do you, in a more comprehensive, more subtle way, reduce sodium in processed food? Uh, and in restaurant food, knowing you know, that, that roughly 80% of the sodium in people's diet does come from food that, 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 uh, that they're purchasing in the supermarket in a restaurant. It's not what you put on you know, with the salt shaker at, at home. So you know, we've got to find a way to, to, to modify that food environment in a way that will give people a better chance of getting uh, to an acceptable, uh, from a health standpoint, acceptable level of, of sodium intake. So we've done a lot of homework uh, as a first step on this to, uh, to look at some 150 food categories and lay out targets for reducing uh, that would be in keeping with the IOM report in terms of gradual comprehensive reduction, uh, but addressing the technological issues that, that have to be addressed in, in looking to reduce sodium in processed food. There is a flavor issue that has to be taken into account, but there are also other uh, food technology issues, uh, some safety issues for some products. And so we've done technical homework on that. We, we, we hope to be able to publish uh, in the not too distant future and sometime next year a tar what we would think are the appropriate targets um, based upon this science and put that out for public comment and, and hopefully in the short term contribute to the work that some in industry are already doing to reduce sodium, but, but provide guidance that is a benchmark for, for the industry as a whole and then figure out how we take that guidance, you know, refine it scientifically, and then you know, move down the pathway towards sodium reduction. We think that's one of the most important uh, public health things that, that we can be doing. Uh, finally, just uh, highlight uh, some labeling uh, work that's going on, or in one case has, has been completed. Um, we did issue uh, in September a final regulation defining gluten-free. Uh, we had a statutory mandate to do this. There had never been a, 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 a regulatory definition of gluten-free. This is a critically important for the population of celiac disease patients who depend upon being able to construct gluten-free diets. We work very closely with that community to, to come up with a definition uh, that, that meets their needs. And so that, that rule was, was issued uh, in, in September and, and will be implemented uh, within the next year or so. And I think we'll make, uh, again, make life a little bit easier for that population of people who, who struggle uh, with their diets. Uh, Bob mentioned the Nutrition Facts uh, panel, which had its 20th anniversary uh, earlier this year. We are soon going to be initiating a rulemaking process to update the Nutrition Facts panel. Um, things have changed since this, uh, this was first uh, created uh, 20 years ago. You know, back then, the, the, the preoccupation was with fat and calories from fat with no distinction among types of fat. We now know that there are good fats and bad fats, and we, we also know that from an obesity standpoint, calorie, uh, calorie intake is, is more significant than, than fat in, in the abstract. So, so we're going to be looking to, for some refinements of the way in which we feature calories on the, on the label. Um, uh, we're going to probably up play calories, downplay fat in certain ways. We'll still be telling you the percent you know, DV, daily value of fat in the product, but 
what's the right format and proportion so this is most useful to consumers. Serving sizes have changed to some extent. So, you know, the current serving size assumed uh, in the, in the, in the uh, for purposes of the daily value calculations was, is, uh, for soft drinks is eight ounces. Um, I think nobody thinks that the average serving of, uh, of soft drink in this country is eight ounces, so the data show that it should be higher than that, and so we're going to propose changing that, um, uh, those serving sizes of, of, of that kind. And finally, um, as a, one of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that gets less attention than the website is, uh, is the menu labeling, um, restaurant menu labeling requirement in, uh, in the ACA, which, which mandates us to require, to set out the rules that, that, that require calorie declaration on menus in chain uh, restaurants with 20 or more units. So, so you'll be seeing, we, we, we published a proposed rule about a year and a half ago. Um, we expect in 2014 to publish a final rule um, that will uh, mandate what you're already seeing in some local jurisdictions and some companies doing it voluntarily. But you know, restaurant menus containing calorie information adjacent to the, the item that you're purchasing. So, um, you know, for people who want to control their calorie intake, we think that this is a very positive step forward. It's not a panacea, um, but we think it's an important, uh, important innovation. I know myself when uh, Mayor Bloomberg implemented um, calorie labeling in New York City and I went to the Starbucks in my daughter's neighborhood in, in Brooklyn and saw that the pound cake had 490 calories for a little slice. I, I decided not to get it, so. Um, so that's the laundry list. You know, sometimes we feel like we've got all these balls in the air. We're a one-armed paper hanger. You, you figure out the, um, you know, the metaphor. Um, um, but uh, but we're, we're grateful to be having the opportunity that we have to work on these issues, you know, and, and the environment in which we're working now is very supportive of making progress on these issues, working, you know, within the administration, working with our stakeholders, work, working with Congress. We feel like, by and large, you know, we've got good support to make progress on a lot of fronts, and we're very determined, you know, to make as much progress as, as, we, as we can. I think you're going to be seeing, on most of the issues I've mentioned, further steps in the coming year. Um, you know, I think uh, the thing that I, I ask of this community, you know, is, is to engage us. Um, and I don't need to preach to CLF. You guys do that quite well. And, and, uh, um, but, but, you know, we need from the, the public health and the scientific community, you know, we need the research. You know, we need the analysis. Um, we need the ideas about how to address these issues. Uh, uh, we need the students to come work for us. Um, uh, but we, you know, we, we value, we benefit enormously from the engagement of the community in what we do. We cannot possibly succeed um, just uh, sitting in our offices. And uh, so I'm, one reason I'm here is to, is to just say how much I welcome what we've, we've already benefited from from this institution and look forward to working uh, with you in the future. Thank you. That was Ron? That was terrific, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Uh, we have two uh, microphone carriers. Because this is being uh, web streamed, we ask that you use the microphone and wait for it. And Mike, I'll let you uh, point to people uh, that you want. I'm also going to, while you're answering the first question, uh, go back to the first slide to show the hashtag for those of you who are watching and uh, want to uh, pose a question to the Deputy Commissioner. So thank you again. Oh, there it is. Great. Um, <laughs> and I'll let you take over from here. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I have kind of two related questions, and you can answer whichever one you think is easier or both. Um, <laughs> So what is the FDA's position or current um, strategic positioning for reducing the consumption of corn um, and also of meat in the diet of Americans? Um, because those two things have kind of been considered an issue in balancing our so diets. So corn, you want me to take on corn and meat? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> 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 I could do without corn and meat, but I can't do without potatoes. So, um, well, I think your question kind of helps frame this issue that I was um, I addressed a little bit earlier about what is our job, um, and you know, one job that we don't have 
and that we find out quickly and reminded we don't have is when we try to tell people what to eat. Uh, it's just, it's not our job. Um, and, you know, I, it is also not our job to set agricultural policy. And I, I, was, I should have mentioned when I was talking about the public policy environment that affects health outcomes, we all know that agricultural policy does that in a big way. And so the subsidies, you know, that, that exist uh, that produce a lot of cheap har uh, carbohydrate that, that is used to produce a lot of cheap protein. You know, those are agricultural policies of our country that are real and that have effects on the cost and availability, low cost and, and widespread availability, you know, of these commodities. Um, you know, our, our stance at FDA in terms of influencing what people eat you know, is to support the dietary guidelines, um, which talk about balance and talk about limiting meat intake, and we subscribe to all of that. But but beyond that, and beyond that sort of being part of the public health education role and sort of nutrition guidance, you know, dietary guidance function, you know, we don't, we're not using regulatory tools for the purpose of reducing consumption of, of, of these products. You know, there are opportunities, um, you know, through labeling to influence choice in a positive way. And so you'll, there may be some elements of what we're doing. I'm not going to probably announce them here today, but when we update the nutrition facts label, there may be elements there where we can provide more information about what the, the composition of food is that could help drive towards healthier choices, you know, on issues like added sugar, for example, which is another sort of part of that corn cycle. Um, so uh, again, I, you know, we, 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 we succeed you know, when we stick as much as possible to public health goals that we are given regulatory you know, authority, statutory authority to address, and if we plot you know, strategies that make a practical difference on those items, as worthwhile as it might be you know, to have policies, public policies that affect the basic structure of the diet, you know, we, you know, we don't see that as something we're equipped and empowered to do. I, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer to you, but it's kind of the reality of, of our world. Yeah. I, I hate to be the one that chooses here, because there's probably lots of politics involved in who gets chosen. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Michael, thank you for the talk. I appreciate the, the broad overview. I have two questions related to the veterinary medicine side of the, of the charge. Yep. The first deals with animal welfare. There are no real standards for animal welfare of farm animals. Will the FDA take that on as part of its responsibility to define what is appropriate animal welfare for each of the species that we use as food? That's the first question. And the second question really is on dealing with the antibiotics. Are some therapeutic levels of antibiotics used for disease prevention as the new thing is written? Yeah. Yeah, the, let me deal with the first question first, and then I'll deal with the antibiotic question. Um, I mean, again, FDA has no charge, no statutory authority, no mandate, and frankly, no wherewithal to address humane, you know, practices in animal production and, and slaughter. USDA specifically has authority uh, with respect to the slaughter process um, and, and a direction to deal with humane slaughter practices. And there is, you know, there is an animal welfare statutory framework that USDA implements, but it, it doesn't address what you're, talk, you know, you're talking about in terms of close confinement animal production. Um, so again, I, I, you know, we see that as a topic of legitimate concern from a, from a public health and food safety standpoint to the extent that intensive, uh, very intense animal production practices have an effect on food safety. Um, because it, and it can affect the, the incidence of, of infected animals, you know, with, with E. coli and salmonella coming into slaughter plants. But again, F, the meat safety is not FDA's job. USDA has the statutory mandate and authority. It's simply outside of our jurisdiction, uh, you know, to regulate that. So again, take your points, and I think there's progress to be made in how, how, food, how food safety is addressed by virtual practices at the point of animal production. It's just not something that we have jurisdiction over. Uh, the issue that you know you're raising about prevention uses of antimicrobials that is the the hot button point on what we're doing and where we're going on dealing with antimicrobial resistance and it was the the all the pointed questions that we got yesterday in our, our press outreach were about that basically uh, so let me just tell you my perspective on that what we're doing and and, and kind of where we need to go uh, from here on that and and I don't know how many I'm going to take a minute to just drill down here just to 
um, just to dem if only to demonstrate that we've, we've really thought about this and we think what we're doing is going to make a practical difference, but we, we got to keep working at it. Um, and the issue that's you know, being raised is that there, you can think of kind of a spectrum of, of uses of antibiotics in, in animal agriculture, starting with what, I've, what we're getting rid of, which is um, the, the purely production uses, where it's, it has no animal health benefit, it's solely to, to promote rapid growth, you know, efficient use of feed, it's purely economically driven. Uh, and, it, and it's done in a way that, that it, it f typically involves using low doses of antibiotics, but over the lifetime of the animal. I mean, that's the typical kind of approach uh, to the use of, of, of these products. At the other end of the spectrum, there are, you know, treatment uses where you have a, a sick animal in front of you, and, and, the, and you're, the question is, do you use an antibiotic to treat that? And, and it's very widely accepted in veterinary medicine. And, um, and we don't get pushback on, on this, that, that there are uses where there's sick animals that should be treated for the welfare of the animal, and then ultimately for food animals for the protection of, of, of consumers. So that's at the other end of the spectrum. It's this, it's this strata of uses in between that are for prevention of diseases that are, are at issue here. And I think the concern of the, of, of the community and, and CLF, I think, is that, is that somehow uh, notwithstanding the veterinary supervision that we are, we are going to be requiring of these remaining prevention uses, that there will be practices where farmers one day will have been using the antibiotic for, um, for uh, production, for growth promotion uses, and without changing what they're doing, simply declare that to be a prevention use, um, and then, it'll, then they'll sail along you know, unaffected by what we're doing. That, you know, nothing could be further from the intent and, the, and what we think is going to be the impact of what we're doing. Because what, what we have done is not only get rid of, you know, make, uh, over this phase out period, get rid of the, the production uses so they will no longer be legal. We've also laid out criteria for what constitutes a legitimate prevention use. And it's criteria that have to do with, you know, the very specific circumstances under which the drug would be believed by the veterinarian you know, to have a legitimate prevention purpose. Is there a specific disease that needs to be prevented? Is there a specific agent, bacterial or other agent, that's causing the disease? Um, do we have an understanding of, of how it is that, you know, from an effectiveness standpoint, that this use actually uh, prevents the disease? And, is, and are there no alternatives to preventing, you know, the disease condition? And so, so what we envision happening, and we've got to see to it that it does actually happen, is that any, to the extent that there are prevention uses on labels, that, that the use of those, which now for the first time will be under the supervision of a veterinarian who is licensed and, and uh, required to, to exercise you know, sound veterinary medical judgment, you know, we've laid out the guidance that we expect veterinarians to follow in prescribing antibiotics for treatment, for prevention uses, so that they will be legitimate prevention uses. So, so that's, the, that's the game plan. You know, we've got to be sure that actually happens. And I know you're skeptical. We had a good chat, you know, before the meeting that that will actually happen. Um, we cannot take it for granted that that will happen. We have to work as we have already with the American Veterinary Medical Association, which strongly supports this initiative, takes seriously the professional responsibility of its members. I think once, you know, and when we'll be part of, let's face it, part of the accountability that will happen by virtue of what you guys will do, I, I presume, is to look over the shoulder of the veterinary community. I mean, people don't operate without accountability in our society anymore, with everybody on the planet being able to take the picture and tweet what they see and report. I mean, it, you know, so let's use that, that, that accountability, those accountability tools to be sure that this actually happens. So, you know, we want to work with this community as well as the animal health industry, as well as the, the animal producers. We want to work to get the practical result to make the real change on the ground that will make a difference for public health. So. Um, that's where we are, and, and you know, we took, we, we tried to characterize what we did yesterday as a big step, but not the last step. You know, there's, there's more that can and, and should be done, and over time we hope to be able to achieve it. But I, I feel kind of bullish about this because, you know, for 40 years, we've been unable to take a concrete step that, that really moves in the right direction on this issue. And I think, uh, I think it's to the credit of the agency that, uh, and to the community that we've been working with. Uh, that we've been able to take this step and, um, you know, hold our feet to the fire. So, thank you. I really hate to be the chooser. Bob, you should get up here and, and do your job as the moderator. And please. please. <laughs> anyway, please, uh, go ahead. Yes, please. <laughs> 
it sounds uh, very interesting in the beginning of the talk when you were talking about the impact of food safety in human health. And I was, when you were mentioning people who got sick and uh, died uh, with diseases related with food, it, it struck me because I heard a very small number. I would expect a much a larger number of uh, taking into account that we eat so many times a day and there are 300 million mm -hmm. people. And I wonder who, how are the information systems regarding who collected that information of outbreaks yeah. in the community? Yeah. And, death in the community that can be associated with food. Because, for instance, I would consider that obesity-related deaths can be, can be are associated with food also. I don't know if yeah. my question is clear. Well, the, the illnesses that I was referring to are ones caused by microbial pathogens in food. Um, and I, 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 3,000 deaths, 125,000 hospitalizations, 48 million illnesses. These are estimates that the Centers for Disease Control develops and puts out um, based upon their food net active surveillance system and a, a whole elaborate process of collecting data, actively seeking out case information, and then also doing studies that, that take into account underreporting. And so they use multipliers to come up with estimates. So they are estimates, and they, but they are targeted on uh, pathogen-associated foodborne illness. The number of 3,000 deaths, I mean, that's small compared to the morbi you know, uh, mortality associated with obesity or heart disease or a number of other uh, diet-related you know, chronic diseases, and granted, but, um, but it, has a lot of, you know, it has a lot of salience uh, from a, both a public health and public policy standpoint, because first of all, most of these are, 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 are preventable if, if folks throughout the food system take the right steps to prevent the, path the presence of the pathogen, and when they happen, they have a disproportionate negative effect on the food system economically. I mean, the reason the law was passed was partly because the industry understood that when a big outbreak occurs and you're, you're in the lettuce business and someone messes up lettuce and there's a big outbreak, demand for lettuce goes down comprehensively. Um, and, and, consumer, and that's because consumer confidence goes down. And so you then have the, the, the negative externality of, of people not having confidence in fresh fruits and vegetables, which you want them to be eating more of. So yeah, the numbers are relatively small compared to some of the other bigger public health problems, but the, the consequences for consumers and the food system are pretty significant, which is, you know, which is why Congress passed the law. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I had a follow-up, actually, to your earlier answer on uh, the use of antibiotics for disease prevention mm -hmm. uh, in two parts, actually. Uh, first, as you know, the guidance document that you released yesterday asks drug companies to make voluntary changes to their labels uh, so that you know, the use of an antibiotic for growth promotion is no longer permitted. Um, you did mention criteria. Uh, in the guidance document, I have it right here, uh, for how disease prevention may be judicious, how a veterinarian might use an antibiotic in a judicious way to prevent disease. But isn't it true that none of the changes that you're asking drug companies to make would make those criteria binding upon anybody? And isn't it true that there are no other plans to make those criteria binding upon anybody so that there are really no restrictions being put into place with respect to disease prevention at the present time? Yeah. This, this, so I've got, finally gotten the oversight hearing I was hoping for. Isn't it true, Mr. Taylor? That's, um, um, so I think you made the point that once the, once the, uh, the production uses come off the label, they, they are illegal. Um, the, your question really is whether there are any real restraints on the, the remaining prevention uses. And, um, you know, one, so, and then there are two, so there are two categories in terms of giving you the answer from a legal standpoint. Um, you know, to the, to the extent that um, companies come in with new prevention uses, you know, they will, they will go through a, an approval process where our, these criteria will be applied and limits will be put on the labeled indication um, uh, that, uh, that constrain legally the, the ability of the, the the rancher and the veterinarian to, to use the product for anything other than those tightly defined uh, conditions. I think the real issue has to do with existing prevention uh, indications that are not on the label currently constrained 
in, in that sort of way. They're more, somewhat less defined. Um, and this is where, you know, again, our, where we are right now in this process uh, is that, that we expect, we, we believe prevention means what we say in that document, in that guidance document. Uh, we expect veterinarians to use their judgment uh, and, and to apply their expertise to, to prescribe these products in accordance with that guidance. Um, and there, there's a point at which, you know, we, we would have the authority. If, 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 a, if, a, if a, once we get production uses off the label, if a veterinarian is prescribing and a, and a producer is using a drug in what is transparently not a legitimate prevention way, but is in fact a growth promotion disease prevention or, or growth promotion uh, feed efficiency way, then that's, that's illegal. So, so there's, there's some, you know, there's certainly some legal accountability there. I think it's an open question. When, when we say that we took a step and, you know, there's more work to be done, I think it's an open question what happens, you know, and how we, we might assess those, um, you know, those remaining more general open-ended prevention uses. And we've got we've to see, you know, what progress we make with the, with the step that we've been able to take so far. So um, you're putting your finger on a legitimate issue. Uh, but it, there's not zero accountability. Is there adequate accountability? And we'll have, we, have to, we have to figure that out. We have to, to be cognizant of that and, and, and keep working at that. We're almost out of time. Uh, there have been a number of comments and questions on the Twitter feed. And the one that uh, Christine Grillo uh, uh, selected as most salient was the Good. comment about 1977 and the Congress wouldn't allow the FDA. Can you expand on that? What, what was it that they... No, they, they it was, uh, I forget exactly the sequence of events, but it was basically using the appropriations process. Congress can very readily, um, if they don't want you to work on something, put language in either the appropriations bill or in the report language, which basically says none of the money that FDA is getting or any other agency is getting may be used for this purpose. Um, and I, I'd have to go back and sort of check whether it was in the bill language and the report language, but, 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 you know, but we were, FDA was stopped, basically, politically from going forward. So, yeah. so <clears throat> analogous for our public health students in the audience to uh, the fact that the CDC was prevented from doing research on gun injury for a period of, what, about 16 years? Uh, through okay, yeah. language uh, imposed by Congress. Well, Mike, uh, thank you. This was Pleasure. a terrific talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the Lion's Den and bearding I, us so effectively. I, this is the most fun I've had in quite a while, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, no offense, uh, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look, this is enjoyable for me. Really, I appreciate it and appreciate the questions. And you know, it, it's important for us to have people in the community thinking about these things and asking these questions, not only of me, but of others in the process. So totally welcomed. Great. Thank well, you. thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.